Hello, this is a special Mr. B video, uh, a new series in fact. Uh, we are in the unusual times of uh, school closure here in the UK and, um, and so we are now trying to teach lessons from, from our homes. And so on Mr. B's ukulele channel for the next few weeks I'm going to be releasing extra uh, videos and extra episodes uh, with all sorts of different um, music lessons and music related lessons attached. But my channel is still going to function as normal and on Mondays and Fridays I will be releasing my normal ukulele videos so they will still happen as exactly as normal but in between and in addition to those there will be uh, many more uh, new releases on this channel which I hope the children at school will all enjoy and also anyone else out there um, stuck at home uh, in this uh, sort of national lockdown period. So I hope everyone enjoys the videos and uh, I hope everyone enjoys this new addition to the channel. This is the story of the Nightingale by Hans Christian Andersen and I am reading this from the book Fairy Tales of Hans Christian Andersen. And to go with this story I have chosen the music of Gustav Holst and we are going to be listening to his Japanese suite uh, as we enjoy this story. And I will tell you more about Holst and his music at the end of the video where I will also be setting you a couple of challenges uh, to go with this story today. Okay, here we go. The Nightingale Ancient China was a great empire, a land filled with glittering cities, snow-capped mountains and blue snaking rivers. A long line of powerful emperors reigned over this vast kingdom, each more noble than the last. This story is about the very greatest of them all. The Emperor of China was a proud and stately ruler. His first decree had been to build a magnificent palace. Master craftsmen were brought from all over the kingdom, architects, carpenters, sculptors and artists. The palace was made from the most exquisite oriental porcelain. Delicately decorated walls glimmered as the Emperor swept down the corridors in his fine silks, attended by an army of servants. A thousand priceless treasures adorned the sitting rooms and balconies. Every window overlooked the beautiful palace gardens. What of you, the Emperor would say with joy, it is without equal. The gardens were indeed a masterpiece. The graceful walkways stretched as far as the eye could see in every direction. The paths were dotted with bridges and willow trees. The flowers were exquisite. Frothy orange blossom, pale lilies and sweet-scented camellias grew in abundance. Gardeners tended the blooms, decorating their stems with tiny silver bells. As the Emperor passed, the bells would sway in the breeze, making a charming tinkling sound. The Emperor's gardens were vast. Far, far away, at the very furthest reaches, stood a mighty forest. The trees were broad and tall, their branches entwined into a canopy of emerald green. The forest ran all the way down to the deep blue sea. There, by the water, lived a tiny nightingale. The nightingale loved to sing. Every evening it would sit on its branch and warble in the twilight. As it sang, the bird's little chest puffed out and its eyes shone with joy. Sometimes a poor fisherman would reel in his nets just below the nightingale's tree. The beautiful song would make him stop working and sit for a moment on the shore. I am alone, he would say, and I am very little. Yet this dear bird makes my heart fill with happiness. What a rare gift it has. Talk of the Emperor's spectacular palace spread far and wide. More and more sailing ships arrived, bringing visitors from distant countries. As the processions made their way through the forest, a lucky few would hear the nightingale's song. The Emperor's visitors admired the splendid porcelain palace and its stunning gardens. They walked along the blossom-lined avenues and listened to the tinkling silver bells. They stood on the dainty wooden bridges and gazed at the lilies lifting their faces up to the sun. Every detail was heavenly, and yet those that had heard it could not forget the sound of the tiny bird in the forest. After such beauty, nothing else could compare. The Emperor has created a wonder, they would tell their friends, but that nightingale in the forest, it is the very best of all. The palace did indeed become a wonder of the world. Its beauty was held in such esteem, many wrote about it in their letters, poems and stories. The Emperor liked to entertain himself by reading those books. How he loved to hear about his exquisite jade sculptures, fine tapestries and divine gardens. He would sit in his throne room, nodding his approval at each new line of praise. One day, however, a shout thundered out from the royal hall. What is this? bellowed the Emperor. The Lord in waiting rushed into the throne room. The Emperor was holding a piece of parchment up with an angry, shaking hand. The parchment told of the matchless beauty of the Nightingale's song. Why are 
Why have I not heard of this creature, said the Emperor? Strangers know my realm better than I do. I am humiliated. Your Highness, your Highness groveled the Lord in waiting, making a deep bow. Nothing is more beautiful than your palace. This book cannot be true. No one in court has ever seen such a bird. I must see it and I shall hear it sing, snapped the Emperor. Find the nightingale and bring it to me, or the court shall pay the price. The Lord in waiting scuttled off in a terrible panic, shouting for butlers and footmen, gardeners and chambermaids. The servants ran up and down the corridors, searching hopelessly for the nightingale. Every corner and every cupboard of the palace was searched. The day was drawing on, but the bird was nowhere to be found. The Lord in waiting wrung his hands. The Emperor could not be disappointed. This nightingale, he panicked, it must be a silly fairy tale. A young kitchen girl happened to walk by, carrying a stack of dishes. I know the nightingale, she said, turning towards the window. The Lord in waiting was so relieved he could have jumped for joy. Speak, he ordered. If what you say is true, you shall be rewarded. The kitchen maid put down her dishes. She gazed out across the palace gardens towards the forest in the distance. My mother lives a long way from here, she began. Every evening I walk through the forest to get to her little house by the shore. When I am at my most weary, the nightingale sings a song to cheer me. The music lifts my heart. I cannot describe the music. I cannot describe the magic that it weaves. The Lord in waiting clapped his hands. There wasn't a moment to lose. He called for a lantern, straightened his hat and rushed down the palace staircase. Come little kitchen maid, he called over his shoulder. We leave at once. The Lord in waiting and the kitchen maid hurried through the palace gardens, followed by half of the court. They passed the formal lawns and the fountains, the tinkling flowers and the pagodas, and eventually the path meandered into the fields. A deep moan rang across the, across the meadow. Is that the nightingale I hear? cried the courtier. How lovely! The kitchen maid shook her head. That's just a cow lowing in the field, she replied. There was still further to go. The group hurried on. The ground got boggier. The courtiers had to scoop up their robes to keep them out of the mud. A rasping croak broke the silence. Another courtier called out. That must be it. How beautiful it is. That is just a frog calling across the marsh, said the kitchen maid. You will know when the nightingale sings. The kitchen maid was right. When the courtiers reached the forest, the most marvellous music came to their ears. The nightingale's song was even more wonderful than they had ever imagined. Where is this creature? asked the lord in waiting earnestly. The emperor must hear its song. The kitchen maid pointed up to a tiny bird perched in the branches above. The lord in waiting was expecting to see a spectacular bird, but this little creature was drab and brown. It was no bigger than the palm of his hand. Is it really you making that enchanting sound? asked the Lord in waiting. It is me, said the nightingale, fluttering closer. It bobbed its head, then sang again. Another melody danced through the forest, so clear and pure, it made the courtiers gasp in astonishment. Little nightingale, the Lord in waiting said solemnly, please accompany us back to the palace. You must entertain the royal court with your charming song. I am just a bird, the nightingale replied quietly. My music sounds best among the trees of the forest. The Lord in waiting pressed his hands together, then bowed his head low. My master has asked to hear your song, he said. It is his express wish. When it heard that, the little bird was overwhelmed. How could it refuse the Emperor of China? It would be an honour, it chirped. I shall come gladly. And so the tiny drab little bird was taken to the palace. As the nightingale fluttered into the court, a throng of elegantly dressed courtiers and ladies bowed before it. The room was full to bursting, even the kitchen maid had been allowed to come into the throne room and hear the visitor's song. What a splendid place, thought the bird, taking in the sight of gleaming porcelain walls, rich tapestries and a thousand golden lamps flickering from the ceiling. Ex exotic flowers decorated with tinkling bells had been brought in from the palace garden, filling the chamber with a heavenly scent. The nightingale felt a long way from its shady home in the forest. The lord in waiting clapped his hands. The room instantly fell silent. Dear Nightingale, he said politely, may I present you to his Imperial Majesty, the Emperor of China. The courtier pointed to a small golden perch positioned in front of an ornate throne. A little man sat there impatiently tapping his fingers. I am pleased to meet your Highness, said the Nightingale, taking its place. Without further ado, it held up its head, puffed out its chest and began to sing. The room was spellbound. The little bird sang so gloriously, it was as if the world had stopped for a moment. When the nightingale looked at its host, the emperor was overcome. Tears of joy streamed down his cheeks. 
The nightingale sang again. This time the melody held such tenderness it touched the emperor's very heart. Enchanting, he exclaimed, leaping up from his throne. The most enchanting sound I have ever heard. The nightingale bowed his, its head modestly, and when the emperor offered rewards of coins, gift and trinkets, it refused. I have seen tears of joy spring to the emperor's eyes, it warbled gently. What further reward could a little bird need? The visit was a success, but when it was time for the nightingale to leave, the emperor jumped to his feet. He summoned the lord-in-waiting to his side. The nightingale cannot leave me, he announced. It shall live here in the palace. Make it so. The lord-in-waiting bowed his head. The emperor could not be denied. And so the nightingale didn't go back to the forest. Instead, instead it lived in a gilded cage in the palace. The lord-in-waiting saw that the little bird had the best of everything. A dozen servants attended to it, offering sweetmeats and tidbits wherever it desired. The nightingale had a beautifully detailed perch crafted from solid gold. Twice a day the cage door was opened, but the bird never strayed far. It had no choice. The servants each held onto a fine silk ribbon tied around its leg. The bird never complained, but its eyes grew sad. It missed the dappled lights of the forest and the hush-hush sound of the ocean waves breaking on the shore. One day the Lord-in-waiting brought in a parcel for the Emperor. It was a gift from the Emperor of Japan. Inside was a mechanical bird made out of silver and gold. It was the same size as the nightingale in the cage, but this bird wasn't dull and brown. Its gleaming body and wings twinkled with precious gemstones. The Emperor was filled with joy by his new toy. I wonder if it can sing, he mused. Call the music master. The music master was an elderly man with a long beard. He examined the mechanical bird closely and wound up a cog at the front. The model nightingale began to sing a pretty little tune, bobbing its tail to its feet. The people in the court clapped politely and nodded their heads. Now let's hear it sing with the real nightingale, said the emperor. The emperor's servants opened the door of the nightingale's cage. The music master tapped his baton and pressed the button at the back of the model bird. The mechanical nightingale and the real nightingale began to sing together, both beautifully, but not quite in time. The model nightingale performed the same song over and over again, but the real bird sang from its heart, changing the tune as it pleased. We cannot blame the mechanical bird, insisted the music master. It was a textbook performance. The music master wound the cog up again and set the artificial sick bird singing on its own. The bird sang at least 30 times without pausing or tiring. The emperor and his courtiers listened spellbound, marvelling at the rubies and sapphires glittering all over its body. Nobody noticed the real nightingale hop off its perch and fly away back to the forest. When the emperor did at least look up, at last look up and spot the empty cage, he frowned in disappointment. Why would the nightingale want to leave me, he asked, after everything that I've done for it too. The lord-in-waiting and the music master fused around the emperor. They convinced him that the model bird was far superior to the dowdy little creature that had entertained him before. The jeweled nightingale will never let you down, insisted the lord-in-waiting. It is perfect and most predictable. The music master nodded his head. The model bird is a mechanical masterpiece. It is a gift fit for an emperor. And so the emperor did not mourn the loss of the little nightingale. Instead, he demanded a public concert to show off his new toy. Everybody in the palace poured into the throne room to listen to the dazzling mechanical bird. The chamber rang out with the sound of applause. The concert was a dazzling success. People clamoured to praise the newcomer's glittering decorations and intricate song. Only one person did not make a fuss about the mechanical bird. The poor fisherman, who had heard the real nightingale down by the shore. He'd come to the palace to sell his catch of fish and had been drawn into the performance. The fisherman listened. This bobbing and whirring machine looked very fancy, but it didn't quite have the magic of the true nightingale. Something real was lacking. After that, the emperor banned the real nightingale from ever returning to the palace. A dull brown bird doesn't belong in my fine chamber, he scoffed. The lord-in-waiting placed the mechanical nightingale on a velvet cushion beside the emperor's bed so that he could gaze at it every day. It became the emperor's most prized possession. He invited overseas visitors to the palace just so they could witness its splendour. The artificial bird was even given its own royal title, Grand Imperial Lullaby Singer to the Emperor of China. News of the mechanical bird spread. After a year, many books and journals had been written about it, which pleased the emperor enormously. One night, however, the unthinkable happened. 
The bird was entertaining the emperor with its usual song when something inside the mechanical machine snapped. Ting! The cogs inside the nightingale judded to a stop. The artificial bird's lovely music was replaced with an empty click, click, clicking sound. The emperor's eyes filled with dread. He couldn't do without his nightingale. He called for his lord in waiting. The lord in waiting called for the music master. The music master called for the watchmaker. The watchmaker took the mechanical creature apart, cog by cog, spring by spring. His fingers trembled with anxiety as the emperor leaned over his shoulder, watching his every move. Slowly, carefully, he repaired the, br the brake and put the tiny parts back together again. The emperor smiled when the mechanical bird started to sing again. It is fixed, he declared, clapping his hands happily. The watchmaker coughed nervously. The bird is fixed for now, he warned. The parts inside are worn out and cannot be replaced. If your maj majesty winds up the cogs too often, they will break completely and the nightingale's song will be lost forever. The bird can only be played once a year, if at all. The emperor was very disappointed. From now on, he would have to do without his bedtime lullabies. He could only gaze at the jeweled nightingale instead. Five years passed. It was not a happy time for the emperor. Every day he grew weaker and paler. Eventually he became so ill he was confined to his bedchamber. The great ruler of China was now a wizened figure lying in the middle of an opulent four-poster bed looking up upon his mechanical nightingale. The palace courtiers grew more and more worried about the emperor's health. A throng of people outside the palace gates waving flags wished him well and cheered his heart. Soon the emperor had grown so cold and lifeless he could barely breathe. The lord in waiting began to plan for his master's succession. A new emperor was lined up to take his crown. Courtiers and servants waited in silence. Outside, in the palace gardens, the silver bells were cut from every flower so that his majesty would not be disturbed. One evening a full moon cast its silvery light into the royal bedchamber. The emperor was so close to death he could barely lift his head up to look out of the window. His feverish mind was overcome by dark and terrible nightmares. When the Emperor could stand it no longer, he stared across at the jewel-encrusted nightingale and begged it to sing just one last time. The bird, of course, stayed silent. It was fragile now, and there was no one there to wind it up. The Emperor closed his eyes in despair and sank his head onto his pillow. This must be the end, he sighed. No one can hear me, and there is nothing left to live for. But someone had heard the Emperor. Suddenly, a blissful harmony floated in on the evening breeze. This was the real nightingale, perched on a blossom spray outside the palace window. He came back, whispered the, the Emperor, his eyes filling with tears. The nightingale sang on. Its melody had never sounded more tender or more beautiful. The Emperor's nightmares faded into the shadows and he felt comfort in his heart. The colour began to return to his face. The fever had disappeared. I do not deserve to hear your sweet music, said the Emperor humbly. How can I repay you for this kindness? Let me give you a home in this palace. I will surround you with all the gold and jewels that you could ever wish for. I do not wish for gold or jewels, said the nightingale, and I cannot live in a palace. Knowing that I have touched your heart is all the repayment I need. The emperor's face paled again. He knew he could not do without the nightingale's lovely song. The bird fluttered closer. I will still visit you, it said gently. Let me come and go to the forest as I please and every evening I will perch on this tree and sing to you about what I have seen. I will tell you about the people that I meet, the merchants, the farmers and the lowly fishermen on the shore. Your porcelain palace is very fine, but you are surrounded by courtiers that simply want to please you. I will sing you the truth, happy and sad, so that you can rule this kingdom fairly and with all your heart. The Emperor's face filled with happiness. He promised to keep the Nightingale's visits a secret, and then he sang into the sweetest, most peaceful sleep he had ever had in his life. The next day, the Lord-in-waiting crept nervously into the Emperor's bedchamber, wondering whether his master had made it through the night. He blinked in surprise. His Imperial Majesty was up, dressed and standing in front of the window. Good morning, dear man, the Emperor cried, his face filled with smiles. Let's get to work. I have a kingdom to run. There we go, the story of the Nightingale. 
Now, as we listened to that story, we listened um, along with the music of Gustav Holst, and it was his Japanese suite that uh, we uh, we enjoyed there with that wonderful story by Hans Christian Andersen. So um, I want to take you a couple of quick challenges about Gustav Holst's music. Gustav Holst is an English composer from the Romantic period, very famous for a lot of his other music, uh, in particular uh, a set of pieces called the Planet Suite, which I'm sure you will have heard of uh, some of those before. Now if you want to do some more research about Holst, you can have a look at uh, Mr B's Top Trump's card, uh, which is on the screen now for you to uh, get a few ideas from. Uh, but I'm going to set you a couple of challenges, and uh, when you complete these, you can uh, send your replies or your responses to your uh, class teachers through Class Dojo, and uh, then they can email those to me, and I will um, use the best answers in um, one of my videos later on in the week. Okay, for my first challenge for the story of the nightingale, I want you to imagine that beautiful garden, that beautiful palace garden that the Emperor of China had made where he lived. And I want you to imagine the beautiful ponds and the paths, the trees and the flowers, the birds singing, uh, the flowing water, uh, the beautiful sounds and sights of that garden. And I want you to write me three descriptive sentences to describe what that garden looked like. Three wonderful sentences that are a joy to listen to. And I want you to see if you can do the most wonderful writing that you can. Just three short sentences and, uh, and then you can submit those to us uh, later on and, and we'll see uh, what wonderful ideas you all come up with. Now for the second challenge, it's a bit more of a listening one this one. You've got to listen to the music that runs in the background of this video as I tell the story. So you've got to listen to Holst's Japanese Suite. And I want you to pick out two parts of the music. Now a suite of music is a set of pieces and Holst's Japanese Suite is a set of different dances. Now two of the dances are called the Dance of the Cherry Tree and the Dance of the Wolves. And I want you to try and spot at which point in the video the Dance of the Cherry Tree starts and when does the Dance of the Wolves start. So have a think about what do you think a Dance of the Wolves or a Dance of the Cherry Tree would sound like and when can you spot it in the video. Now your answer is going to be a timestamp. So you need to look at the video and see what time in the video those sounds where you think those two dances start, what time in the video has, has the video got to. So for example it might be 5.34 or, or 6.25. Uh, so it will be a timestamp like that. Uh, so see if you can spot those two dances and uh, write them down and then send them with your three wonderful sentences to your class teachers who can email them to me. And then next week I'm going to release another video following this up and I'll share some of your wonderful ideas um, on the video and I'll also give you the answer to those two, uh, to that challenge there as well. Okay, I hope everyone's enjoyed watching this video. Do stay safe everyone and see you very soon.